It's very important bits. Thank you for the hands. They are always really appreciated in the speaker selfies. Raising your hands. Okay, someone's uh, still coming in. That's well. Warm welcome to the latecomers. Yes? Yay! No, no, we haven't started yet, so don't worry about it. Just, just messing, just messing. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think we're slightly behind schedule, so I'm just going to dive uh, straight into it. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the, the very boring uh, slide about me. Uh, at the top, you've got my Twitter handle, if you want to follow me. Uh, and it should probably not uh, come as a surprise to you that I consider myself a testing junkie, given that I'm doing a second testing-related talk uh, over here at GreatConf. So uh, what I'm about to show you today, I don't think it's groundbreaking. Uh, and I suspect that some of you have done similar things in the past, or at least um, uh, parts of, of what I'll be showing. Uh, but uh, all I'm going to be talking about is how to make uh, writing and maintaining your integration and functional slash uh, UI tests uh, easier, uh, thanks to uh, test fixtures. Uh, uh, I know that the title of the talk is Groovy Test Fixtures, but it is a bit of a, um, of a trap because actually most of the stuff I'll be uh, showing you today is not really that much Groovy related, it's just general techniques. Um, a couple of things will be specific to Groovy, uh, but as I said, in general, they will be uh, general and applicable to um, whichever language uh, you are using. Okay, so I consider myself really lucky that uh, back in uh, mid noughties when, when I was at uni, uh, we were actually told how to write unit tests, where back in the day it wasn't really um, that popular and it was, uh, was something that, um, that was an up-and-coming thing to do, to write your unit test um, 10, 15 years ago. So they've taught us, uh, the one thing they didn't show us is actually how to write unit tests for real-life classes, so classes that have collaborators. So all we did ever was writing tests for like stacks and, and stuff that had like zero collaborators, right? So um, when you start writing uh, unit tests for classes that have collaborators, uh, you're going to need test doubles. Yeah, so uh, if you really want to test a unit, you need to isol isolate that unit from the surrounding world. And this is where uh, test double doubles come in. Uh, so anybody can tell me what is the difference between a stop and a mock? Yay, go for it, Kevin. Correct, yeah, that's, that's, what I would, that's what I would say. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, what you do is, uh, okay, that's going to be interesting. How do I? How do I turn this on? Okay. So basically what you do is you write your, uh, your unit tests. Everything is fine. It's all good. Unit tests are important. But as developers, we know that when you start running your application that is only unit tested, bad things will happen as on the video. So uh, what, I what I would say is probably while unit tests are good and important and we need to write them, uh, you probably cannot get away without adding some integration or even end-to-end uh, -end test coverage. So what happens with your collaborators when you go up the test pyramid into the, inter uh, um, into the integration and uh, functional testing space? Uh, they are still there. They are just not classes anymore, but there are uh, third p systems that live outside of your application under tests. So uh, what you would have is um, you know, other uh, HTTP services if you, uh, if you are dealing in 
uh, with a microservices uh, uh, architecture, or maybe you're using some third-party HTTP services, you probably have a database, uh, maybe some cache like a uh, ser service like Redish, uh, um, Redis, uh, and so on and so on. So you still have collaborators. Uh, you, um, you, uh, it's just a different, different type of collaborators. Uh, the talk is about test fixtures, but I haven't really um, explained yet what I mean by test fixture. So I would say that there are two types of test fixtures that I, I can think of. First one is going to be any code that uh, helps you start up your application under test for, the, for your integration or, or um, uh, functional test. And the second type of test fixtures are, uh, is code that helps you to set up and then maintain state of collaborators of your application of your, uh, under, uh, under test. So uh, let's dive into the uh, first demo and have a quick look at how different frameworks uh, deal with uh, starting the application under test uh, for your end-to-end uh, -end test. Uh, I'm going to be showing you uh, var various frameworks just to kind of drive the point that this is not specific. These techniques are not specific to, to uh, the language or to, uh, to, to the framework. So uh, let's start with uh, Spring Boot. Um, what we have over here is a, a really um, simple and boring Hello World application, single controller, always returns Hello World. Uh, actually, let's uh, change it to return hello great conf. Uh, and then we have a test uh, over here. And the way to start up uh, a Spring Boot application for your test is to simply use the Spring Boot test annotation added on your, on your specification. Uh, the important bit is you need to change the web environment. By default, the web environment is mock, which does not actually start the application under test. It's more like writing an integration test. But if you set web environment to random port or fixed port, then the whole application, the whole stack will start up and you will be able to, uh, to talk to it over HTTP. Uh, a nice thing is that you can then inject a test, a REST template, which is basically like an HTTP client, uh, and then you can use it to, uh, to call the application, get the body as a string of the uh, response from the request to the root um, uh, path on your application and then verify. So I've changed the uh, the application under test uh, so that we should get a failure. Yeah, we we're expecting hello world. I've changed it to be um, hello uh, great conf. So that's why it's failing. Yeah. So you can you can see basically over here that the whole application is start started um, and then. Uh, we should see that the application is being hit somewhere, or maybe it's actually not logged. Anyway, it is definitely starting the whole application, and we're going through. Uh, we're going through uh, HTTP. Yeah. Uh, another example. Um, uh, maybe I'm going to come back to to that one. So it's kind of specific because you don't have an object that represents your application under test in Spring Boot tests. Uh, and also uh, the startup and the shutdown of the application is dealt for you by the framework, by these magical Spring Boot test annotation. Um, if we're going to have a look at how it, how it looks in Ratpack, uh, again, very, very boring Hello World application. Let's break it. Uh, and we have a test. So what Ratpack does is it provides a class called Groovy Ratpack main application under test. Uh, it's like a fi test fixture that allows you to start up the application. Uh, if you've been to, uh, to Graham's talk yesterday about Micronauts, you saw that uh, Micronaut does something very, very similar to this. Uh, the application under test also provides uh, a nice utility that allows you to, to reach and get an HTTP client that you can then use to talk to the application under test. So in our, in our uh, in our test, what we actually do is we just simply get the body of the response from the root of the application as text, and we assert it. Yeah. So, again, running the test, 
again, the same failure because I, um, I broke the implementation and it's back uh, green again. So the interesting thing about this approach uh, is that basically this application uh, under test fixture is what I call the lazy fixture. So this is a fixture that starts up the, uh, the application when you ask for the address of the application. So before this uh, request, the HTTP client um, will ask the object of application test, hey, application test, what is your, what is your address? And then application just says, I don't know because I haven't started yet. So it starts up and then it gives it back its port and everything. So this guy always starts on a random port. Uh, and then when it actually starts, when you ask it for what is your address. So on the application under test class, uh, let's quickly go through, come on. And all the way, actually, you know what? Uh, yeah, there's this get address method on the application on the test that basically starts it up. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, so when it started, and then what we have over here is uh, Spox auto cleanup annotation that basically calls the uh, close method on this object after the test and stops the application. Okay. So finally, a quick look at um, a drop wizard example, because why not? Uh, again, very simple, uh, hello world uh, resource uh, and a test. So in case of, um, of uh, drop wizard, the support comes as a drop wizard, as a sorry, J unit rule. And a JUnit rule is basically a class that allows you to participate in the life cycle of a test. So it allows you to do something before the test and after the test. And in, in case of uh, this application under test for drop wizard, what happens is the application started before the test and it's stopped after the test because it's, it's, it's a JUnit rule. It implements a JUnit rule um, interface. Uh, so um, yeah, again, it's, it's just a different bit of code but the application under test that the rule uh, allows you to uh, quite easily obtain the client. Uh, then you have to say which URL you want it to, you, uh, to hit, you do a get, and then you verify that the, um, that the application um, responds as you expect. And again, because I broke the implementation, um, it's failing, so let's fix it. Okay, cool. So um, uh, that would be it uh, so far. Okay, so after you've started your application under test, uh, you, you can test it, but then as I said, uh, quite possibly it will have some collaborators. So what are the strategies that you can, uh, you can uh, use when dealing with uh, collaborators of your application under test. One one example is using a real instance of your application of your collaborator. So, for example, it would be a Postgres database or a re real instance uh, of Redis. Uh, if there is a Java implementation of your uh, of your collaborator, uh, you could uh, you could use that. So, for ex an example of that would be uh, HSQLDB, which is um, which allows you to do in-memory um, Java uh, databases. Uh, sorry, SQL databases, but it inside of your JVM uh, process. Uh, another option are generic collaborator test doubles, what I call generic collaborator test doubles. Uh, an example of that is um, uh, Wiremock. So uh, you can think of Wiremock as basically a mocking libra library for HTTP traffic. So if you know what Mokito is, so Mokito is for like unit test mocking and uh, Wiremock would be for HTTP uh, test mocking. Uh, if none of the above works for you, you can always write something by hand and 
uh, while it sounds uh, like uh, it's going to be a lot of work, quite often it allows you to get a better, more expressive uh, API for your, uh, for your uh, test fixture. We're going to see some examples of uh, handcrafted uh, test fixtures later on. Uh, and finally, if you don't really care about the interaction with your collaborator for a given test, uh, what you can do is basically uh, you can inject a bean which completely uh, stabs out that interaction. So instead of sending an email or going to an HTTP uh, third-party service, what you do is you just inject a different, uh, a different implementation of a bean, and that bean basically always, uh, for example, returns a can't response without actually going out. Uh, so when it comes to uh, using... Uh, when it comes to uh, using real services for, uh, for your collaborators, uh, a really cool tool that has uh, recently popped up in, in, in the scene, quite recently, I would say a couple of years, is Docker. And uh, if you are using Docker in your tests, uh, you, you should know about test containers. I know that Kevin is, is advocating uh, quite a lot, so you, you've probably uh, heard of it. Already, it basically allows you to easily run uh, Docker containers inside of your tests. Uh, why do you want to? Why would you want to use it instead of like manually installing an instance of Postgres or, or Redis? Uh, because you should keep the, the the dependencies of your tests together with your tests, right? If you're a new starter on the team, the last thing you want to do is that you get a really long script of 15 services that you need to install on your machine bec before you can run your test. What should, what should basically happen is you check out uh, the project, you run uh, a build command, uh, and everything is resolved and everything works. Uh, another good thing about using this strategy is if you are if you want to re uh, run a real uh, instance of a service that is Linux only, for example, on a Mac, if some of the people on the team uh, develop on a Mac, they can, they can do it easily uh, with Docker and they don't have to worry uh, that uh, some of the dependencies of your application uh, are uh, Linux only. So uh, let's uh, have a quick look at how you can use uh, test containers. Okay, so uh, what we have here is a drop wizard application that allows you to post uh, to-dos and get to-dos. Uh, when you post them, they are added to a repository which is implemented using, uh, using Juke. So uh, nothing special to see here, just the regular uh, SQL, a, a bunch of regular SQL queries uh, into the database. Uh, uh, so obviously, if we want to end-to-end -end test that, uh, we will need uh, we will need a, some kind of database. Uh, and uh, because I can, I decided to use MS SQL Server for this uh, for this example. Uh, actually, to be honest with you, on one of my previous projects, the client stipulated that we use uh, MS SQL Service, and that's why I know that this is a useful technique for that because we actually sometimes needed to run some tests against a real instance of MS SQL Server. So that was what we used. So uh, the um, test containers, it comes with uh, a bunch of uh, pre-canned uh, containers for specific services that might be useful for you in the tests. Uh, so a lot of containers for databases. There are containers for uh, running Selenium tests, uh, so on and so on. But uh, it's also really easy to, to start up any generic uh, Docker container in your test using test containers. Um, the test container implements uh, a JUnit rule again, so we can use the lifecycle of, um, uh, of the test to start up the container and stop it after the test. Uh, and I'm using a slightly different way of um, uh, of starting up the application, uh, the drop wizard application over here, you see it's not longer the uh, JUnit rule, but uh, it is an underlying object, uh, which ba because I need to control the uh, lifecycle uh, a bit better of the application under test, because I need to start the server container first to obtain its um, location, its JDBC URL, because 
as I said again, it's, uh, it's uh, as previously stated, it starts on a random port. Everything just basically in my test starts in a random port. I'm going to explain that in a bit. Uh, but to continue, we have the configuration. We pass it to our application, application under test. We start it, and then we perform two tests. Uh, uh, one is trying to obtain a non-existing to-do, and another one is creating a to-do and then obtaining that to-do. Yeah, so let's run these two tests. It's going to take a while, so I'm going to talk about the uh, random port thing. Uh, so what you want to do is, uh, in, your, in your test, quite often you want to start things on random ports uh, because that allows you not to have any shared resources in your tests. And when it comes to then parallelizing your, um, uh, your test suite, it, it, it's possible. So you can parallelize your test suite as easy as uh, basically setting the max parallel forks option on your Gradle task for your test suite. And then if you want to run two test JVMs in parallel or three test JVMs in parallel, that's, um, uh, that's, that's possible and that's easy. And, and um, as, your, uh, as your test suite grows, uh, you will find it really, really helpful to, to if you make sure that nothing is set to fixed ports and shared between tests uh, because that allows you to run them in parallel. Uh, okay, so as you can see, this has passed. Uh, over here you can, it's probably hard to see, but basically over here you can see that the images are being fetched. Uh, Docker uh, starts up the MSSQL server Linux image and then in our tests we, we, we talk to it. Um, one thing of interest, so basically when you're writing, uh, writing this, this test and you're starting, starting up real deal, real, uh, uh, real application under test, real fixtures, uh, sorry, real uh, collaborators, they will take time to start up and shut down. So um, because we, we have two tests uh, in, this, in this example, uh, what I've already done is uh, I annotated my container and application with shared, which means that there's gon going to be only one instance of the container and application for the whole uh, test class. Uh, and if I didn't have that, what would happen is I would start up the, the, the container and the application and test twice, <coughs> which of course would be slow. Uh, so uh, what you want to do is you want to limit the number of times you start up things. You could take it to, to the next level and basically don't have these containers and application under tests inside or defined inside of your test, but store them in uh, a static, uh, lazy initialized field in a separate class, which would mean that even if you run 50 uh, tests, classes that depend on the MS SQL server container, you would only start it once and shut it down once. The important bit when you start caching instances of your test fixture is remember that if they contain any state, like for example, if you added some data into them, remember that after every single test, you have to clean it up. Yeah? It, of course, is going to take time, but it's going to be quicker than basically throwing everything away and starting from scratch every single test. Yeah? So think about that because as your test suite grows when it comes to integration and, and functional tests, it, things are going to get slower, so try to avoid unnecessary work. Okay. Cool. Uh, next bit is uh, if you don't want to use Docker or you know of an implementation of the service that is JVM based and you just want to run that uh, collaborator inside of your JV test JVM, you can basically use that implementation instead. Um, so let's, let's have a look at example of how you would do that. Okay. So uh, another drop wizard application uh, with um, uh, which basically sends some emails over SMTP. Uh, I would say that more often than not, you would probably use an HTTP service for that for now. That allows you like a third party that allows you to send, uh, send emails uh, nowadays. But uh, for the sake of this example, we're going to use SMTP. 
So what we have over here is, uh, is an email sender uh, service that uh, just basically uh, sends some hello world uh, email uh, using simple Java mail uh, library. Uh, mailer is an abstraction over a service in that library, so basically we build some, some email over here and then we, then we simply send it. And thankfully, uh, there, is, um, uh, there is a Java implementation of an SMTP server. It's called GreenMail. It's very, very useful uh, for tests. Uh, so what we do over here is we create and start up the, um, the, the email server, the SMTP server. Again, we're passing in zero as the port, which means that it's going to start on the random port. Again, if we were to start up multiple uh, uh, servers on, uh, in our tests because they run in parallel, uh, we wouldn't hit uh, contention on, on ports and we could, we could just easily run our tests in parallel. So it's not only your, the server that you're starting up, your application under test, but any collaborator that also opens the port, you might want to run it on a, uh, on a random port. Uh, so uh, after we started the server, again, we have to pass, uh, we have to change the configuration of our application on the test to actually use that particular uh, ser uh, fixture server that, that we have. Uh, we start application, we start the application, we come up with some uh, address for testing. Uh, we then send uh, a request to send email and we pass in the email as part of the, of the URL and send an empty, uh, empty post. Uh, and then what we can do is, instead of having to, you know, then go to the server and use something like POP3 or whatever protocol to get the message out of it, because it runs in the same JVM as we do, we can basically use the API of the, the Java API of the server, server to obtain all of the messages that has been, have been sent to it. Yeah, and then we can take the first message and then we can do some assertions on it. So, um, yeah, actually, I'm going to follow the pattern of breaking things. Let's see, it fell. Yeah, we're expecting hello world as the subject of the message, but it was hello great conf. And fixing and running it again. Oh, green. Yeah, so actually this test, what this test does is sends an HTTP request to the server. The server then sends an S SMTP, uh, sends an email over SMTP to our uh, fixture SMTP server. Uh, and then at the end, we are going to that fixture uh, SMTP server and asking it, like, what are your messages and asserting on what has been sent to it. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, the uh, mo uh, quite, this is, this is a, a really, a really um, a common thing to do, uh, mocking out. Um, your uh, thir uh, uh, third-party HTTP, API, API, uh, HTTP APIs uh, mocking out other microservices in your, uh, in your architecture, microservices architecture. Wiremock is pretty cool. As I said, it is basically, uh, it is for, H uh, Wiremock is for HTTP, uh, what um, Mockito is for, uh, for class mocking or, 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 or class test doubles. Uh, the problem with this technique is that, like with regular mocking, it can get out of sync uh, quite quickly with the real thing. So you might be mocking things different from, uh, from the re reality, what happened in the reality with that service when you, when you actually start talking to it. Uh, there is a technique called uh, consumer-driven contracts. Uh, there are two implementations of that technique I know of. Uh, which is Spring Cloud uh, Contracts, I believe, and another one is Pact Framework. Um, so there are tools that can help you with actually verifying that your mocks are as similar to the real service as possible. 
and you can write tests against them without actually having to set up the whole real service and hitting it. So uh, quick, uh, sorry, quick demo of uh, how you could use Warmock. Okay. So uh, what we have over here is um, an application that uh, exposes an endpoint greet using remote service. And what that endpoint actually does when it's hit, it calls um, some service at greeting service URL uh, under the greet path and basically uh, returns uh, whatever the remote service returns to us as is, just straight without modification. Um, so if you wanted to test it without actually having the real service out there, uh, without having access or without having to start a real service, uh, you could use Wiremock. So uh, we are basically uh, starting a Wiremock server over here. Again, random ports, as I said before. So we got the Wiremock service. We configure our application to um, to use the URL of the Wiremock instance that we've created as its greeting service. Uh, we start up the application. Uh, we come up with a with a greeting that the remote service is supposed to return, uh, and then uh, we we do the stabbing. Yeah. So we're saying that for uh, all re get requests to slash greet. Uh, we want a 200 response uh, with the body of hello world or hello great conf. Um, and then in our test, we hit our application, uh, which will go to the Wiremock instance, get whatever it re returns, and pass it on back to our test. So. Uh, what we have over here is, uh, that's interesting, why did it, oh yeah, because I've changed the, this one, and what I want to do is to change it here, yeah. So, as you see, this is failing because we return this message from Wiremock, which is then passed through our service to the test, and it's definitely not hello world. I'm gonna go back. It's gonna it's gonna pass again. Yeah, I I personally find the the URL of uh, the API of Wiremock quite uh, verbose, and tend to avoid using it in my tests. So what I usually do is I create a custom test fixture that wraps around Wiremock instance, and I have a higher level methods. Uh, that then underneath set up stops on my Wiremock instance just to, to clear clean the uh, the uh, the code the test code a bit because I think this is this is really verbose it's definitely not as easy and cool as stabbing in in Spock for example yeah it's it's more verbose Cool, so as I said before, sometimes there are cases uh, where, you, where you're gonna need to write some custom fixtures, not use stuff that is out there, out of the box for you. So uh, one thing, one reason why you would want to do it is create a, a more expressive API, as I just explained on the uh, Wiremock example. Uh, and let's have a look at some examples from the open sor source world uh, of custom fixtures. Yeah? Uh, so what we have over here is, uh, is an example of, uh, of a test uh, in Jeb's code base. And what you can see is that um, there's some, you know, there some HTML probably set up over here with two divs. Uh, both of these divs have some IDs and some classes. And then we're using JEP to uh, select uh, the divs by IDs and then assert that they have certain classes. Yeah? So I think you would agree with me that this reads fairly well uh, and is expressive and you can understand what the, what the test is actually doing. But what happens underneath this is there's actually a real Jetty HTTP server, embedded HTTP server running as part of this test. 
And what this DSL does is it sets up that um, a Jetty server to return the response, uh, which is described uh, by the body of disclosure. And what is backing disclosure is uh, Groovy's markup builder. So, so basically, you can, you can write any markup in here using a very familiar uh, API if you are a, uh, a Groovy developer. Yeah? So I think this is, um, this is pretty cool. Uh, that's been already set up when I joined uh, Jet Project. Uh, as, a, uh, as a committer, and uh, it makes writing tests JEP for JEP internally, JEP owns tests, really, really easy and quick. You just come up with some uh, uh, HTML snippet in your, in your head, you, you put it down in like two, two three, four lines of code, uh, and then you, can, then you can use basically uh, JEP code to, to verify that things work the way they are supposed so so the the, the browser uh, the yeah the, the the driver that that this jet code is using is set up to actually hit the uh, the embedded jetty um, server that is backing this DSL yeah so this is also a stub like thing so we don't uh, we don't verify anything over here we just uh, we just say like if somebody comes over and asks uh, and, and sends a request to us, this is what we should re respond with. But we can also do verification in, uh, in custom, uh, in custom uh, fixtures. So this is, this is slightly modified, but this comes from Gradle's code base. Uh, so basically, again, uh, I'm going to read it as I understand it, and, and, and I think you agree wi with me that it's fairly easy to do. So we have some Maven HTTP repo over here. Uh, and we declare a module of uh, the, the group of the modules come dot example, the artifact ID is core, and the version is 1.0. And then what we do with this module, we just publish it to this Maven HTTP repo. Then we have some build file that uh, sets up, uh, that, that says that the dependencies should be resolved from a Maven repository that points at our uh, HTTP, Maven HTTP repo fixture. Um, we declare a compile configuration. We add our module created for the test as a dependency to that configuration. And then we have a task that re uh, resolves that compile configuration into a libs directory. Yeah. So far, so good. And then the, the, the mock-like uh, part where we are saying that in our test, we are expecting that a get request will be sent for the POM file of our module and a GET request will be sent for the artifact file of our module. Yeah? Then we run the retrieve uh, task, which uh, resolves the, uh, the configuration and puts the file into the libs directory. And we verify that it's actually what happened, that, one of the, uh, that the artifact for the module that we have defined in our test has been resolved. Uh, we then take a snapshot of that artifact. So basically what this does uh, is it takes uh, an M MD5 uh, hash and, um, and uh, modification date of that file and puts it into that, uh, that variable. Uh, then we reset the expectation of our service. So what happens over here? If any of the get uh, calls of, of, of the get request has not happened, we would get a failure over here. Uh, and if any other request to our mock HTTP Maven repository happened between here and, he and, and here, we would get an, an error, right? Because we have to exactly say it's strict mocking. So if anything else happens, just throw an error. Yeah. Then what we do is we run retrieve again. And because we don't specify any, um, any expectations between reset and, and running the task, we are saying essentially like there should be no more requests to that, um, to that HTTP server. Uh, and we also verify that the file uh, has not changed. Yeah. So this is really powerful. I think the, um, uh, the, the, the Gradle code base is full of, of, of uh, really cool fixtures like that. It's, uh, it is also quite complex uh, code base, so you just won't go in there and, and, and start looking at things unless you're, you're, you're writing some tests. But if you ever get to contribute, uh, I think what the guys have done over there when it comes to uh, 
fixture support for your tests is, is just amazing. It's really easy to, um, to use and, and fun to use. Um, okay, uh, next thing that, uh, that you can do is uh, changing the context of your application under test to basically completely cut off certain interactions with your collaborators. And why would you want to do that? Uh, several reasons. For example, you've verified that interaction in another test and you just don't want to test it at such a high level. You don't want to say the uh, setup of, the, of, of your collaborator is expensive and some of the code that deals with talking to that collaborator is also expensive and you just don't want to lose a lot of time in your tests. Um, so that might be uh, one reason. Uh, uh, yeah, and one thing to note is I talked about caching your, uh, your fixtures. Uh, if you start changing the application under test context, your fixture, your, your application under test fixture is no, no longer cacheable. So you have to be careful. Um, you, you, you have to be careful what you're doing because in essence, it's a, it really, because you've changed the internals of the application, it's a in different instance of an application. So you either cannot cache anymore, or you have to have two instances, one with mocked out uh, interactions and one with uh, hitting the real service, you know, stuff, stuff like that. So uh, let's have a look at uh, how you can modify uh, the uh, context of your application under, te under test to uh, use mocked out uh, services that don't actually talk to your collaborators. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to show you how it's done in Spring Boot. Um, so we have an, again, email sending controller, uh, which actually does two things. Uh, it sends an email and then stores the address the email was sent to uh, in, uh, in a repository. Yeah. Again, this is probably not how you would write it in a real application and not definitely not in a controller. But what I'm doing over here is just showing you, um, uh, showing you examples of, of what can be done. It's probably not production code. Uh, so what we have over here is an email sender that actually doesn't send emails, which means that we will not need an SMTP server set up as part of our tests if we use that. And then uh, if you've used Spring Boot, you know that there is a concept of configuration in Spring Boot, which, is, uh, which allows you to, to configure your context, application context, using Java code. And if for a given test, you want to change the context of the application under test, uh, what you can do is have a um, static inner class uh, and put uh, add test configuration on top of it. Uh, and then define uh, the beans that you want to be overridden uh, for your particular test. Yeah? So if I now run it, instead of the real email sender being injected, the uh, mocked one will be injected. So you can see that the log statement that I showed you before is actually printed. Yeah? So in our test, we still verify that other things, not the email interaction, we still verify that the, uh, the, the, the address has been, has been stored in the database. Yeah, we're doing a select over here. But in this particular case, we don't care about the email, if it's sent or not, so we just decide to, to mock it out completely. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, so now we get into the groovy specific stuff, uh, and I only have a couple of minutes, so that's always how it is, but anyway. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of groovy remote control, but if you ever need to reach into your application under test, in from your test code, uh, into its internal, access its con um, uh, application context, obtain beans uh, out of that application context, uh, groovy remote control is your friend. So basically what, it's, what it does is it allows you to declare uh, 
uh, closures, which are then executed inside of your, uh, of your server, inside of your application. And how does it do it? It basically takes the uh, class of the closure, it serializes it, it puts it inside of a HTTP requests, sends it over the wire. Inside of the server, it deserializes the class, the closure class, runs that, gets the results uh, of that, serializes and sends it back to your uh, test in an HTTP response. So there's quite a lot of magic going over there, uh, but it is really, really, really uh, powerful uh, thing uh, that you might consider in your in your uh, toolbox. Uh, it's frame. It's it, what is important is, is it's modular and it is framework agnostic. So I used it with Grails in the past. I used it with Ratpack, which has a built a built-in support for it, and I use it with uh, Drop Wizard uh, recently uh, as well. Uh, so uh, the biggest problem with it is there is no documentation at all. There was some on Codehouse, but with the demise of Codehouse, it's all gone. So you have to basically do a bit of legwork to, uh, to use it. Uh, your best bet is probably this example that I'll be showing you, or uh, having a look at the tests inside of Ratpack. There are, there is, uh, as I said, built-in support in Ratpack for um, for remote control, and there are some tests that exercise that support. So you might have a look over there how, to, how it's how it's used. So uh, what do we have over here? Um, Another application. Uh, this time we only can get the applications written in a way that we cannot use the application to write anything into the database. We can only get to the repositories out of the database. Yeah, so we only have this endpoint to 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 deal with. And then what we do in um, in our test uh, is basically uh, we have a custom uh, custom test fixture that allows us to. Uh, that, that provides, that provides um, remote control support for us. Um, and what you can do is basically say, on this application under test, obtain remote control for it and execute this block of code inside of the application. Get the DSL context, which is the entry point of Juke. Um, it's an entry point class of Juke. So get it from the, con from the application context and then perform this SQL to insert that to do into the database. And then we can, we can carry on to perform our tests. So we're hitting the public API of the, of the application under test to obtain the to-do that we've written over here. And then we basically verify that it is exactly the same. Yeah? So as I said, it's, it's really cool. Um, I, it, there are certain situations where, where it proves very, very, very useful. Um, just make sure that you don't enable that in production, yeah? Yeah, just, that's, that's the only caveat. So I've, I've, other team members I usually work with, they are kind of like scared of this, but there are certain techniques that you can employ that it is never, never, you can, what you can do is actually you can take out the jar, um, the, make sure that the, the remote control jar is not part of your, um, of your artifact that you're building, so, so even even if something goes wrong, nothing will will execute. Yeah. And now quickly, uh, quickly about uh, data builders. So Groovy is really good language for writing uh, writing DSLs, especially closure nest, nested closure DSLs. Uh, and this proves really helpful when you try to write data builders. So basically fixtures that allow you to uh, populate your database of your application under test in a very express expressive um, and, uh, and easy way. So it speeds up uh, the time, it speeds up, uh, yeah, it, it basically speeds up writing the tests. It helps maintaining them. It helps reading them because you are only dealing with the data that is important for the test and not the fact that you have to set up 17 other objects that are, uh, that are necessary uh, for the for, for your test, but they don't really participate in your test. If you if you know what I mean. So, um, 
Last quick demo. So uh, data builders. Uh, I'm not going to be showing you the, uh, the implementation of that. I'm going to talk uh, in a minute about where you can have a look at these examples after the talk so you can check out how things are implemented. But basically what I'm saying is uh, DSLs like that are, are possible. Um, so basically what we're saying over here is we have a post that has a title and some tags and an author. And what this does, it actually creates all of the, um, all of the um, entities and writes that into the database. So you look at that, it's really, um, it's really expressive. You know what's going on. Uh, and, and then you can, you can basically perform, uh, perform your, uh, your test. So we are checking and we are obtaining all of the uh, posts uh, tagged with Gradle and all the posts tagged with Groovy. So ideally, because this test only deals with, um, with uh, post tags, we, wouldn't, we would change our DSL, our builder, to actually provide dummy titles and authors for us. So we would basically, uh, we would basically only deal with tags in this, in, this, in this test, so it would be even more expressive, because post needs a title and it needs an author in the database because there are con constraints, uh, there, w there will be constraint violations if it didn't have. But for the sake of this test, the fact that there is a title and author is completely not important. Yeah? All that is important is which posts are tagged which, with which, which tags. So um, for f to simplify the example, I still set up the title and author, but in an ideal world, I would modify my builder to, uh, to actually uh, not have to do it, and it would be done for me behind the scenes, either randomly generated or fixed or, or whatever. Okay, so I've got two more slides. So what we've been through today is basically various strategies when it comes to test fixtures, um, which means that uh, if you employ them, you will be able to keep your test set up close to your test, uh, which uh, will make your tests more re re uh, readable and more reliable and easier to write. If you in invest time in writing fixtures and expressive DSLs, that will also uh, enable you to write your tests uh, and read your tests, which is, which is even more important, faster. Uh, and I was talking about these random ports and not sharing uh, resources so that your uh, test suites stay parallelizable. Okay, if you want to have a look at the examples, because I was just, just going through them really, really quickly, uh, if you go to GitHub to, uh, to my uh, username slash test fixture examples, uh, you will be able to, uh, to check it out. There's a Gradle project. All of the tests run, at least they run when I committed the thing yesterday. So. Uh, I'm, I think I've run over a bit, uh, so I don't know if, uh, if we have some time for any questions. Uh, hopefully we have four. Yeah, uh, one, one or two questions if, uh, if you have any. Yeah? No, so what you do is basically uh, you... Uh, you um, you just register an endpoint, remote slash remote control, or whatever you want it to be, an endpoint inside of your application, and there are helpers inside of the library to, to, to help you to implement that endpoint. Uh, so for my example, I used, um, I used uh, uh, Drop Wizard, and remote control comes in with a serverless implementation of that endpoint. So I'm using the remote control server as a base class from, uh, from the remote control uh, library. And all I have to do is implement the receiver. And basically uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm defining a custom delegate of the methods that I'm sending over remote control. So a custom delegate of the closures that I'm sending over remote control, uh, which basically allows me to pull things out of juice uh, application context. Yeah, so that's why that's why I said it is um, 
it is agnostic of, uh, of frameworks because all you have to do is implement an endpoint and there's quite a lot of support already for you to implement an endpoint. And what is important is there is a concept, uh, what is interesting, sorry, uh, there is a concept of uh, transports in, HD in uh, remote control, which means the default transport is over HTTP, but if you wanted to do remote control over, uh, say, RabbitMQ, that would not be uh, hard either because you would just need to uh, change the uh, implementation of the transport. And what the transport does is basically there is an <coughs> input stream and output stream, and you just have to, that's what the library gives you, that's your abstraction, and if you can write something uh, from one stream and then get the response into another stream, you have your new transport implemented. Yeah? Okay, cool, thank you very much.